<laughs> with, the, with the folks that are coming. All right. Well, we will get cooking in just a minute. So the the question of the day, Jeff, the icebreaker for everybody that's coming in early, the icebreaker is where are you from? Number one, put it in the chat. And number two, have you done anything interesting this this uh this summer? So that's the question. And you don't have to be interesting. You might have done something interesting, Jeff, because I know some of us aren't as interesting as others. <laughs> So what did you, have you done anything interesting? I got a wild one for everybody. Well, I mean, I went to Las Vegas with the family since my youngest turned 21. That was fun. That's awesome. Um, well, that, Maryland that's from nothing wrong with place, Vegas. In your neck of the woods. So yeah, that's yeah. a couple so of trips. So I'm going to yeah. pop, I'm going to pop this in to the chat. So just open up the chat. Everybody can chat to everybody else. So I'm Dave and I'm from Woodstock, Maryland which is not too far outside of Ellicott City, not too far out of Columbia, between Baltimore and Frederick, for those of you who, Maryland, if you don't know those things. So, and I did a thing in Yellowstone where we literally were within five feet of a grizzly bear. Oh, wow. Not only that, it was a, it was a cub. <laughs> a mama bear and another cub. Oh, wow. Five, now, we were in a car, Right. We're in a car, but what's the biggest rule about grizzly bears? Don't feed them. <laughs> don't feed. Don't. Well, we, fortunately, we didn't do that. They so, away. We were in Yellowstone, and we were at the front of. They would cross right in front of us, right? So, so that's what that's what happened to me. So, where are you from? And what do you have? Anything that happened? You can raise your hand, and I'll unmute you, and you can tell us your story. But my story is two, three grizzly bears crossed right in front of us on in Yellowstone. And then the one bear, the one little little bear started following us down the road. And my wife says, slow down. He's following us. I'm like, no. <laughs> Speed up. Rule number one, do not mess with the cubs. So anyhow, there you go. <clears throat> and Jess from Illinois. So where are you from? We always like to know where you're from and, uh, and what you're up to is always great. And we will get started. We're going to be talking about artificial intelligence one of the hottest topics in the world right now right jeff absolutely it is out of hand it's craziness um so we will do that and we want to make sure we welcome everybody as you're coming in uh, let us know where you're coming from we have tons of agency participation in in these interagency briefings on ai it's a big big deal there are a group of there's a group of people with one of the organizations here. We appreciate you guys joining us. Um, and I think there's probably going to be some additional conversations after this that you're going to want to you're going to want to direct some things in that agency because you don't have, I don't know, 18 people from the same agency if they don't have a problem <laughs> or not looking for a solution. <clears throat> so we, we just want to welcome everybody. We know that you have a lot of things to do, especially this time of year. So we appreciate you joining us. A quick disclaimer as we get started from GSA, because you guys are GSA contract holders, and it's not an endorsement, it's informational purposes only. You guys can participate without endorsing or even intending to endorse anybody. So there you go. If you would like to participate with us, we love this. We love participation. You can raise your hand. You can pop it in the Q&A. We, um, we will also provide some resources at the end that we'll send out to everybody. But if you need something in private, send it to jeff.lanham at divine.com, D-I-V-I-H-N, pronounced divine. Uh, and you can, if you want to take a picture of that real quick before we jump off, that way you have it. And uh, we, we asked this question coming in. This will be the best briefing ever. Breaks down sci-fi from reality. Oh, is there any stuff like that happening? I can't imagine. Uh, Daniel from EPA addresses AI and government contract administration. Certainly can do that. Uh, Julie from VA, how to protect myself in the future. A lot of concerns about protection, right, Jeff? Absolutely. Yeah. Very big topic. topic. Uh, and a lot of folks with Jerry as well. I hear that AI will not take any jobs from any federal employees. Um, and you got something to say about that real quick? You want to address that one on the head to head? Yeah, I, I think the th thing to think about there is that AI probably won't directly replace people per se, but it, you know, definitely will be a distinction between people that understand how to work with and how to utilize AI and those that do not. So I think the best thing you can do is understand this technology 
get into, you know, using it some as we're going to show you how today and, you know, be one of the people that's helping lead this and use this as opposed to one of the ones that might get rolled over by it. So, Ooh. yep. Cause you know, there's not a lot of people that are riding horses anymore. There's not a lot of people that are doing steam trains. Uh, so there you go. Uh, there, it is new technology and it is, I don't think it's going anywhere. Do you, nope, do you Jeff? Nope, so nope. Mary from the VA, I, I learned how AI will hopefully enhance my communication with veteran population. Great example of utilizing it for your role. Great job, Mary. Uh, Dave, Clarence, Tyler, Brian, just learn something. That means anything. We okay. teach them anything. And this will be the best briefing ever. <laughs> Jeff from it's FDA. It addresses biases in AI. Yes, it's not perfect, is it? No, definitely. We'll talk about that. That's a key topic. Yep, yep. And Rose, if the live demo of the most advanced AI, I do believe Rose <laughs> will have the best briefing she's ever seen before. I think so too, hopefully. All right. So please address this. AI is used in human capital and not just for hiring. Uh, are CEUs available? Yes. All you need to do is just let us know that you want one and we'll get you one. I'll get you the, the uh, certificate of participation. Uh, test from CMS, a civilian government employees permitted to use AI tools for their work? If so, to what extent? What are the limitations are there? I don't know that that's completely defined yet. Is it, Jeff? It's not, but we will definitely suggest some things to where you can be as safe as possible in the current circumstances and point you to some places where there will be more information about that. Nice. Uh, Michael from the VA, data bricks and other mainstream AI NLP. Wow, that's some. That's uh -huh. a sidebar, Michael. You have to take them machine written memo, all that stuff. We'll take that off the side. Uh, Jerry from the VA, does the federal government see any AI phenom and is a slippery slope that will start taking jobs again with the jobs? Very, very, very interesting. Uh, will it cost any federal jobs? Do And then Victoria, do AI programs spy on users? Oh, very good question. Considering well, some of the things that we that. see out there. Short answer is yes. Yep, that would be true. All right, so let's ask this question. Why are you here? Are you in the hot seat? Are you the one that's responsible for this? Are you trying to get your head around it? You want to be part of the AI dialogue? You pick as many as you want. Or are you afraid you're going to turn the corner and say, I'll be back. Or Will Smith is going to be there with our robot. So there you go. And that's 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 our uh, as our attempt at uh, AI humor, Jeff. Or Tom Cruise, right? Because in the that's true. He's uh, working against the AI as well. So that's true. You got Tom Cruise. Should have put Tom Cruise in there too, <laughs> and probably James Bond. Because those two man, did those have you seen the latest ones? Man, he could have interchangeable. Pretty great. <laughs> Anyhow, good stuff. So a uh, little bit about Divine. Why? Uh, so so Divine's been in. Um, in the IT space for for a good while, um, they have a lot of a lot of experience in cloud enterprise, on premise cybersecurity solutions. Obviously, there's a little bit of cybersecurity issues with AI. They also have an intellectual property that they utilize and help federal the federal government with. They have a lot of contributions in uh, with FBI, with different universities, and and thought leadership in. Uh, in both cyber and cloud and AI, so uh, community nonprofits as well. Founded in 2002, as you see there, they are, they are SBA 8A and they have a GSA contract. And like I said, no obligation to buy from anybody. But hey, if you need some services, you might want to look up Divine. So well, with this, I'm going to end this. But Go ahead. Sorry to, nope. sorry to jump in, but uh, news, I don't even know if you know yet, but our president and CEO just got his top secret clearance. So opens the doors to some secure stuff as well. It, that it, is it, awesome. That is awesome. Yeah. And um, that's, you can share that here. <laughs> Very good. So good. So why are you here? It looks like this. There's a couple people that are on the hot seat. A lot of folks trying to get their head around it. They want to be uh, by the dialogue. And you have a couple of folks that are concerned about what it might do. We have 34% of the been in the gov brief before. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome. To, good to see you guys. Always, always love to have folks that are there. So we have this next one, this next one for the polls, and I'll get to some questions. There might be some in there. What is your level exposure to this? Uh, and it, with that, I'm going to hand this off to you. Stop sharing this bad boy. And you're going to take over, Jeff, and share that out. But it, have you tried it? Maybe you tried it a little bit. I can't believe there's nobody's never heard of it anymore, right? 
And it's think about that. AI hitting the space relatively recently. The concept of AI AI is one thing, but Chat GPT has really put this on the map, right? Right, Jeff? Absolutely. I mean, about November or so when it first came out, I mean, it's been in the news basically every day since then. And yep. Many articles a day at this point. So definitely uh, top of mind. Many articles a day and some of them even written by AI. <laughs> Not just a few either. So yeah, well, while we're waiting on this, so the other part tried it some. Very few are using it regularly. Fantastic. We're glad that you're here. And um, and we'll make sure that, let me make sure. I, where are my Q&A? Somebody popped something. I thought somebody did something in somewhere. All right, I got folks that would like CEUs. That's fair. We'll get those. <clears throat> Uh, CPs, you can get either because what we're going to do is we're going to get you a, a a certificate of participation and you just get that for, uh, approved by your supervisor. And whatever that credit looks like is what you get. How about that, Chandra? All right. Uh, Shonda. I'm sorry, Shonda. All right. Very good. And we'll stop this poll in three, two, one, and Boom, Jeff, you're on. Let's take us through this about talking about it responsibly because we do want to be responsible, I think, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at our agenda here as we're getting into this, right? So we'll start with an introduction that provides some background on what AI is about in general, um, as well as how it relates specifically to folks in government. We'll do a couple of demonstrations actually that showcase both the power and the ease of use of some real world AI solutions and some things that are kind of above and beyond as well. So, and then of course we will wrap it up with a quick look at the, what I like to call the darker side of AI um, in terms of trust and responsibility and, and all that. And then wrap it up with some final thoughts on uh, how you can start utilizing this amazing technology in your everyday lives. That is fantastic. So without further ado, let's get on into it. So a um, couple quick things, you know, AI from the government perspective, we'll start with this. Um, so the National AI Initiative Act of 2020 became law in January of 21, and it provides for a coordinated program across the entire federal government to accelerate AI research and application uh, for the nation's economic prosperity and national security. So the AI.gov website is a great resource that includes links to many departments and agencies that have useful information on the development and use of AI in the government space. So strongly encourage you to go check that out. Lots of great information there, probably answers questions about what you can and can't do to some extent, and definitely you know, what's going on in the government around all this stuff. Here's a quick slide about uh, an overview of some of the recent legislation that relates to the use of AI in the federal space. As you can see, there's a number of significant bills that deal directly with artificial intelligence um, and you know, a number of others that relate to it as well. Um, main objectives that span all of these really speaks to the whole purpose of our presentation today, which is about embracing AI in a holistic way while being mindful of the risks and threats that it can create. So clearly there's a substantial interest in AI in the government and a lot of money actually going into um, trying to understand it and trying to you know, use it and trying to put some regulatory framework around it as well. Um, speaking of, uh, in addition to the legislative activity, uh, federal policy continues to evolve pretty quickly these days, right? A number of initiatives related to the utilization are being implemented at various levels of government, obviously from the White House on down. So lots going on in the government space. And and just to throw in there, yeah. uh, it doesn't matter which administration it is, the left, right, red, blue, doesn't matter. Everybody yeah. has has concerns. Everybody has um, the, the everybody's united, believe it or not, <laughs> <laughs> the united in being able to help solve the potential challenges that we can all see. Right. Yeah. Uh, as it comes down so. Absolutely, you know, addressing both the, the huge potential, right, and the potentially very big risk as well. So let's go ahead and get the obligatory definition of terms out of the way. Um, <laughs> both of these things are self-explanatory to an extent, but there's some nuances as well. So 
Artificial intelligence or AI is the broadest term here, and it covers pretty much everything related to the notion of mimicking cognition. So, you know, no actual intelligence is really needed at the most basic level or at all in, in some ways. Um, and some of the concepts around AI in general has to do with things like knowledge modeling, symbolic reasoning, and rules-based systems that, you know, uh, apply to different kinds of ways to solve problems using computers. Machine learning, or ML, is a subset of AI. It's a specific type of AI that uses large amounts of data to train a digital model of reality that can then be used for a variety of purposes. Different approaches and different algorithms for machine learning yield solutions to problems of different types, right? And we'll explore a couple of these as we're talking today and in the demos as well. And finally, deep learning is an even narrower term that's a subset of machine learning that applies to complex learning models, usually based on multiple layers of artificial neural networks, which you don't need to know what that means, but it, it's <laughs> complicated as it sounds. Um, and they're trained on huge amounts of data, right? And, and that's what ChatGPT is. It's technically called a large language model. Um, and it and most of the other noteworthy modern web-based AI tools that you find out there um, are using deep learning tra trained on huge amounts of, of, of information. So awesome. possibilities and capabilities are coming out of that. We got a we got uh Jonathan raised his hand. Let's see if we can get him to unmute. Jonathan, you there? You got a you got a way to be able to unmutify yourself. I don't know if it was okay. uh, you there, Jonathan? If not, you know, you can put it in the chat. Yeah, or... pop it in the chat. If you got a question or if you raise the hand like inadvertently, just let me know. I'll put it back down for you. Um oh, he put it back down for himself. So um, that was an erroneous um, question for AI. There you go. You're back. All right. So let's switch gears now and provide some context, you know, for the dramatic recent advancements of AI. And we'll take a real quick look at, at the history here just to give you some context. So the origins of AI can be traced all the way back to ancient Greece, where myths and legends portrayed robots and automatons as intelligent beings, right? Like many other knowledge domains these days, a lot of the foundations were laid by the great thinkers of the day, such as Aristotle and Plato and you know those guys. Uh, fast forwarding a couple thousand years to the middle of the 19th century or so, and early efforts to create computing machines by well-known early computer scientists like Pascal and Babbage and Lovelace and <laughs> Boole and others set the stage for pretty much all the advancements in computing technology that we've seen since then. The foundations of AI itself were formed nearly 100 years later in the mid 20th century, when that's when the term artificial intelligence was, was first conceived and coined. And one of the best known leaders of early AI was a man named Alan Turing, who basically created the first general purpose computer. He also attempted to answer the question of how to determine whether a machine is intelligent in a way that we still use to this day, when which is called the Turing test. It basically asks, does the system exhibit intelligent behavior that is equivalent to or indistinguishable from that of a human, right? So in other words, can it fool a human into thinking that the AI is a human? And interesting, interestingly, one of the earliest semi-successful efforts at, at seeming human came in the form of the first chatbot, which was called Eliza. Eliza is a program that, that took input from the user. You type in you know, a question or a comment, and it would look at that and apply a relatively simple set of rules and then respond with a text output that tried to mimic a psychotherapist of the day. And it, it's pretty cool. We'll actually take a look at it here in a bit. Um, but on a personal note, my very own first exposure to computers was when I saw Eliza running on a Radio Shack computer back when I was in elementary school. So I was instantly hooked and that began my lifelong passion for and eventual career in computer science and obviously still has me interested to this day. Yes. <laughs> so uh, after several periods of boom and bust known as AI winters, the growth of AI really started to take off after the turn of the 21st century. 
The early 2000s were characterized by the development of advanced algorithms and the availability of more powerful computing resources. And that's also when commercialization of this technology really got underway with the, you know, the advent of things like robot vacuum cleaners and self-driving cars and that sort of stuff, right? And over the last 10 years or so, AI has basically exploded. Advanced techniques, including neural networks and generative adversarial networks, <laughs> um, enable dramatic new capabilities. And, and interesting, a, a lot of the milestones in the development of AI have been punctuated by computers that can win playing games with humans, right? Ever more challenging games, beginning with checkers and then chess and then Go, which is a much more complicated game than chess. Um, and even things like StarCraft and Jeopardy. And one of the most impressive fairly recently uh, is computers winning at diplomacy, where the machine not only has to have a deep understanding of the strategy and tactics of the game, but it also must actually outwit its human opponents in player-to-player -player negotiations. So that's a pretty big deal. And you know, I wonder what Dr. Turing would say to that, right? If it can fool <laughs> humans into winning negotiations, you know, it has indeed come a long way since the, the days of Eliza, right? Just a little bit, and certainly a little bit from, from ancient Greece. Yeah, absolutely, right? So now that we've kind of understood the, the foundations and of modern AI, let's dig a little further into what the hype is really all about, right? The next couple slides have a couple different perspectives on areas where AI technology can be most useful today. So this is a general list of some of the most common use cases we see in the real world. And while some of these items do require you know, non-trivial investments in AI tools and solutions in order to realize some of these benefits, many of them can be implemented or, or executed with readily available models and things like ChatGPT. And in fact, the, uh, the items on this slide with orange check boxes are the things we're going to cover in the demo in a few minutes here. So we're going to actually do some show and tell about that stuff. And I would expect pretty much everybody in the audience, regardless of you know which agency you're from or what you're doing, to find at least a couple things on this list where you can see the potential value in addressing real needs and streamlining repetitive tasks using these you know, AI-based solutions. This is another list with some more you know, different kinds of potential opportunities. In this case, in these cases, you know, the state of the technology isn't necessarily as mature as the ones on the previous slide, but heavy investments in all of them, you know, will yield even more new types of solutions in the not too distant future. Some of these things like modern military warfare, right, are pretty much exclusively the domain of the government space. Um, and obviously there's a lot of controversial things about that, but, you know, it's, it's here and it's, you know, you have to you know consider it and keep it in mind. Quick note on the last one on this list, which is known as general artificial intelligence. And unlike every other item on all these slides that are focused on addressing specific needs and challenges and fairly narrow, you know, knowledge domains, GAI represents the effort to create machines that are smart enough to solve many kinds or even all kinds of challenges. This is considered the holy grail of AI research and its achievement, you know, will likely become or prove to be one of the most significant inflection points in human history up there or maybe even surpassing the advent of the internet and, you know, other huge technologies of the last, you know, 40, 50 years. This is the kind of AI that all the movies that we already mentioned, you know, um, are referring to from 2001 A Space Odyssey to Terminator, Robocop, The Matrix, you know, and even like we had mentioned, the latest Mission Impossible. So current estimates of when this, you know, when GAI will become a reality are somewhere in the range of 20 to, you know, 2030 to almost certainly by 2050. So in the next 10 to 20 years or so, you know, we'll probably hit that major milestone. Awesome. Hey, I got a, we had, uh, Graham is asking to get unmutified. You there, Graham? Graham? I saw it work, sort of. No. Yeah. There, Graham? there he is. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I wasn't trying to, to cut off. Please keep, 
keep going. I was just giving you a heads up that there wasn't an option, but it looks like clearly there is an option to uh, speak. So thanks for that. The option is just you can raise your hand or just pop it in the chat. And then because uh, uh, I am the all powerful AI in this briefing. <laughs> the HI. Because it's definitely not real intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So now that we've explored the conceptual foundations, let's actually get into doing some demonstrations here, show and tell some of this stuff. We're going to start with um, some AI language processing with ChatGPT4. Um, this is stuff you can all go do and try out for yourself. And I'm going to give you a couple different examples, and, and um, we'll actually see what this is all about. Let's go ahead and jump in here. So we're going to start with, before we get into ChatGPT, let's just for a little bit of comp comparison, let's actually go do some ELISA. So this is a current implementation of the ELISA program from the mid-1960s. Um, this is one of several universities that have this online for you know, availability and, and seeing how things worked back in the day. So hello, <laughs> can we talk? I'm asking Elias, and he sa she says, how are you? What would you like to discuss? I'm not feeling so good. Did you come to me because you're not feeling so good? Well, yeah. There's a lot of depressing news in the world today, Eliza. What do you have to say to that? You know what's depressing is Erica says, I read the chat GPT-4 passed the bar exam. With, <laughs> and then and then Antonio no. says, with an 80%. <laughs> yep, absolutely, right? It's, it's passed the bar exam. It's passed the LSAT. It does really well on the college entrance exams and all that other stuff. So yeah, kind of scary. So here, you know, we continue our conversation with Eliza. The gist is, you know, it's responding and giving you something back, right? But it's not really hard to trick or fool into, you know, not really knowing what it's talking about. So let us switch gears and try the same thing with ChatGPT and see how, what we get from it, asking it the same questions. Oops, wrong one. Hang on. All right, here we go. So chat GPT-4, do the same thing. Hello, can we talk? And we're going to get, as we will see, a definitely more robust answer than we got from Eliza. I of like course, the way it makes it look like it's question. typing. Is this doing it? That's, that's it does, amazing. actually. I'll talk about what it's actually doing behind the scenes in just a sec here. But yeah, that's 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 a key element of this, right? That's pretty fun. So I'm not feeling so good, ChatGPT. What do you say? Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> and so right off, we start with the disclaimer saying, I'm not a psychotherapist, right? So <laughs> what I say too seriously, but if you need help, here's where you go to get help, right? So it's already responding in a different way and, and much more, you know, realistically. So I, there's a lot of depressing news, what, right, ChatGPT? <laughs> I know how you feel. So it's trying to be sympathetic and it's trying to, you know, really, um, you know, provide some useful things. One one thing interesting about this, if, if anybody has tried JetGPT, and I've done it quite a bit, obviously, it likes to create lists of things. So when you ask it questions or when you tell it to, you know, give you some information about something, it typically responds in the form of an intro paragraph, a list of answers, and then a, a summary paragraph. Of course, you can make it do different things based on how you configure the prompts and things that you're putting into it, um, but that's its default in a lot of cases. And so let's let's go ahead and jump ahead here and say, you know what? Tell me a joke. See if it does a better job of telling a joke than Eliza did. Why did the scarecrow win an award? Because he was outstanding in his field. <laughs> awesome, right? <laughs> oh yeah, buddy. So let's try a couple other things here. So, you know, there's, that's just basically a simple chat, right? And obviously you can tell right off the bat, it's a lot more, uh, you know, comprehensive, a lot more responsive than, you know, old school things like ChatGPT or like, like Eliza rather. So let's do something new that's a little different here. Let's challenge it a little bit more. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and bring up a sample resume here. Doesn't matter what this is exactly, you know, this is not government specific per se, but it definitely could be. In this case, it's a mocked up resume for a software developer role. I'm gonna just go ahead and copy and paste the, the text out of the PDF here, bring it over to ChatGPT and say, 
analyze and summarize this resume in in its suitability for a software developer position. And I'm going to paste in all the content from the resume. And it's going to, scrolling all the way back down to the bottom here, it's going to pretty much give us a shortened summary of the resume. Now, it's already a pretty short resume, so there's not a lot it can summarize. But basically, the gist here is that you can give it some instructions. You can copy and paste in a block of text or a resume or an article or whatever and ask it to summarize it for you. And it will do a pretty good job most of the time of, um, you know, shortening that and giving you back a, a, an abbreviated version. And you can even, if you want to, in the prompt, give it some level, you know, do you want it to summarize at a college level or at a high school level or at a grade wow. school level or in a specific style or something like that? By heard, adjusting the prompt, you can make it do different things. I've heard that um, I was talking with some contracting folks and they've, they've tested this. I don't know that they've implemented it yet, but they were in federal contracting folks. And they were talking about being able to use it to help diagnose how close the answers were to an RFP. So pretty yeah, absolutely. Comparisons, summaries, you know, mm -hmm. um, regurgitations in different ways are some of the things that this is really good at, right? So all that kind of stuff, you know, comparisons, um, lots of capabilities there. Mm -hmm. So that you know, gives you kind of a gist of a couple of things. Um, let us take a little bit of a look behind the scenes and I'm gonna show you a different, actually, I think I already have it brought up here. So let's just go ahead and switch over. So also from OpenAI, basically a slightly um, less intelligent version of ChatGPT, but still using the same underlying technology here is um, the, open AI platform. And so what this gives us that ChatGPT doesn't is the ability to, you know, choose different engines behind the scenes. In this case, I'm going to choose a complete engine and based on the, the text.davinci.003 model, I'm going to turn the temperature all the way down here for a second. And I'm going what to is, turn What does temperature mean? What does that mean? Abilities. Good question, Dave. I will get right back to that in a second. All right. So, um, so I'm going to go ahead and ask it to, in this case, write an introductory paragraph or introduction to a proposal for, uh, well, let's not say board, government board of directors, let's just say for a government agency here. To invest in AI technologies. And so go ahead and submit this. And it's going to give us back a response. And as you'll see, it's going to color code some of these words, right? And so now I'm going to say, okay, let's do, let's ask it to regenerate that again. So I'm going to down here, I'm going to say regenerate, which means create a new answer to the same prompt. Rapid advancement of artificial intelligence technologies, blah, blah, blah. And if I keep on regenerating, it's going to give me the same answer every time. And that is because I have this temperature, as we talked about, turned all the way down to the lowest value. So temperature of zero means effectively zero randomness. If I turn this up to one, which is kind of the default value, and now I regenerate this, we're going to see it's going to give me a different answer each time. Wow. And as I click it a couple times, it has to give it more thought to come back with an answer. And let's try that one more time. So this time, it's quite different than it was the first couple times. So that temperature basically says, don't always pick the most obvious answer. Now, back to your question, Dave, and what's going on here is these color-coded words um, are indicating the probability of each word. So all this is really doing, what these large language model is doing, what ChatGPT does is string words together, right? And it does that based on its assessment of the probability of which word is going to be next based on all the input that it's taken in from the giant chunks of content from the internet that it has been trained on. So it really, you know, it seems intelligent. It seems in some cases like it even has a personality or something, but it really is just linking words together semi-randomly based on probabilities from its knowledge base and from its training data. So uh, can I throw can something see, in here? So I don't know if anybody has done any work with neuro-linguistic programming or anything like that. Tony Robbins is a lot of that did years uh, ago. And I'm looking at this and I see, first of all, exciting pull that down a second i just want to say explosion breakthroughs untapped all these words are highly uh kinesthetic words so it's turn it's turning it into an emotional type of statement so that it it appeals to to an emotion in an emotional 
an emotional state. It's really yeah, interesting right? how that's working. Very complicated model behind this, determining which word it should put next. And obviously you can control the probabilities and these other settings on the right here can further tweak how it decides which next word to pick for each response that it generates. But, you know, the gist is at the end of the day, it's just linking words together. And Dave, when you noted that it takes, you know, a couple seconds as it's spitting out that answer, that's because it's calculating each word next and, you know, spitting it out as it decides which word it wants to put in this particular response. Interesting. Real quick. Um... Uh, Andy said, I, sorry, I missed it. Is the, is the site chat open AI.com, right? That's what we're looking yeah, at. Right so chat.open AI. So you can just go to open AI.com and then you have to sign up, you know, for an account that doesn't cost anything. Um, but sometimes it's not available depending on how busy it is. If you want to pay them like 20 bucks a month, then you get the premium level where you can get constant access to it. And it's a little quicker. Um, and then it's and then this one is a slightly different product from OpenAI called the Platform Playground, but um, you can also use it as well. So you can sign up for these things for free, and you can spend money if you want to get more robust access, basically. Gotcha. And then Ryan's saying, is the data entered in the prompt added to the model to assist with other generated responses? And I think that is that go to your temperature question, Ryan? Is that kind of answered by the temperature? Well, I think the question there is, is it capturing the input we're giving it, you know, and does it do anything with that, right? And again, <laughs> I'm going to talk about that more in when we're done with the demo here, but the gist is, yes, it it will and can capture the input you put into it. Um, and, so better. and Antonio said that within the same chat, yes. And I, and the, so the question I think is a little expanded beyond that, right? Ryan is, is it going to take your information that you're giving it to then propagate whoever asked that question next is, is the question that you're asking, Ryan? Is that what you're Actually, asking? Actually, yes. Yeah, it, I think yeah. that's the question. That is what I'm trying to answer. And then the answer is potentially yes. So, and uh, real quick, Vicky has we'll a, talk about uh, you in a second. Yeah. Vicky, Vicky, go ahead and you, you there, Vicky? Vicky Choi? Got your hand raised on purpose? No. <laughs> it's okay if you didn't. That's all right. I, I, you have the ability to unmute, but go ahead. You keep you keep chatting about this and about chat GPT and the playground. Go ahead. If you want to talk, Vicky, just go ahead. Um, all right. right. So, yeah. So um, the last thing I wanted to show in here, basically, is I told it to write a PowerShell script that calls the Open AI API. So we can use these graphic tools on the on the Internet in their websites but they also provide an uh, application programming interface. So you can write a program to call this. If you wanted to generate a hundred jokes, let's say, for example, right? As opposed to going click, click, click a hundred times and get a hundred jokes back, you can write a program. Now, if you're not a programmer, that's okay because ChatGPT is a programmer. And so you can ask it to write code and it'll give you- This is the crazy part. This right? is insane. What is, what is What he's about to say is crazy. Go ahead. So uh, I'm not going to, I won't go through all this. And, and honestly, it doesn't give you a ready to run program. And there's a couple of things you have to tweak here. But um, just to give you the gist, I'm going to go ahead and kind of shortcut this a bit and show you what the results look like at the end of the day here. So oops, hang on. Yep, here we go. And Antonio says, it's a hit or miss when I use it with SQL. <laughs> Correct. Right? But the fact that it can hit in and of itself especially with some pretty significant programming now i'm a i'm a propeller head myself sort of but i mean jeff's a full-blown data nerd right so <laughs> so he and he he gets in the code i don't know the coding stuff but I, I i work with people that code and it is crazy what some of the things that come up with that you wouldn't necessarily come up with yourself that's the amazing part right jeff absolutely right and so I'm repeatedly running this program now that's a version of what I just showed. Now it's obviously the temperature needs to be adjusted behind the scenes here a little bit because it's giving me the same joke a couple of times. But the gist is, you know, with very little effort and with input from it, I can now call its own API as many times as I want to. And I can even, you know, get it to write me a program that, that does different kinds of prompts and, and re returns different kinds of things and all kinds of cool stuff, right? So... All right, so let's go ahead and move on from all of that. And I'm going to do something a little different here now. So everything that we just showed, uh, actually, let's go back to the slideshow for a second here. All right, so 
Um, a quick recap here on ChatGPT. It's a conversational large language model by OpenAI that can generate human-like text based on a prompt, right? All kinds of cool things it can do. But let's be clear here. There's important things to understand about the limitations and the shortcomings. At the end of the day, like I said, it's just stringing a bunch of words together. Um, and that can have random results, right? And, and this slide is actually from the ChatGPT site that's calling out some examples of what it can do, some of the capabilities and some of the limitations. So keep in mind two, a couple of really big things that it can generate incorrect information. It can make stuff up that's called hallucinating in the AI terminology. Um, that's what we need, produce, hallucinating to be. Exactly, right? It, it can produce harmful results and tell you bad things and do weird stuff, right? And now they keep on changing and updating this and, and correcting some of these errors and, and, and improving it over time, but there's still ways to work around and get it to kind of go off the rails. So be careful, you know, in trusting what it's giving you back. And the other thing to know that it doesn't know anything about the world and events after 2021. So it purposefully isn't up to date on current events. So, you know, it's got a limited knowledge of recent history and things like that. So that, that's important to understand. So now let's switch gears and explore an example of a custom AI solution, right? That was built specifically in this case for a client of mine that happened to be a, a membership association now, that isn't exactly a government-specific scenario, but this type of solution is very representative of what you can do when you create AI solutions with private data and information. Before we're done, we'll connect the dots from how you know this you can you can move from this member retention scenario to potential use cases in the government world. A real quick, Erica says chat GPT makes up case law. So not only does it <laughs> pass the bar. It can make up the law. Make up the law, absolutely, right? <laughs> so before we get into showing the solution here, I'm going to give you a little bit of the scenario because it's kind of important. So this organization was looking for ways to understand their member behavior and disposition so that they can make changes to how they inter interact and engage with their members to improve retention and satisfaction and ultimately member experience, right? So what we did is we took the, their member profile data and their transaction data um, and used it to build and train a custom AI solution that can predict the likelihood of renewal by member and year. So um, we face some challenges in developing this solution that are very common in the AI world. And it basically stems from the less than ideal quality of their data in their database. Before we could actually even use their data to train a model like this, we had to do some work to enrich and enhance the data so that the AI had enough you know, to chew on and make sense out of. Um, the resulting solution outputs a uh, basically a custom spreadsheet that gives us each member and their predicted probability for whether they're going to renew or not for the year in question. And that takes into account the history of the past 10 years and what everybody else has been doing and things about them that it, it uses to decide who's most at risk of leaving and not renewing their membership or who are the, the strongest and best members that, that are very likely to renew. And again, the same kind of solution, anywhere where you wanna take a set of either individuals or organizations, you've got historical behavior data, transactions or interactions or something like that, and you wanna predict their future behavior, that's what this kind of solution can do. The gist of how we do this is this process and again this is this is basically the way to create ai solutions and models and now what goes on inside each of these things is different in some cases but the overall process is pretty similar so you in this case when they're getting super technical we exported the member and transaction data from their association management system we enriched and enhanced that data via a third party information service by processing all those organizations through and saying give us more Formographic data about everybody. And then we took that and transformed it and prepared it and put it into the format that the AI model needs to do its training. That's where the magic basically happens. And that's where you need, you know, data scientists and data engineers um, to do all that. And then in step four, we, we build and train different AI models using various algorithms and parameters. And in step five, we evaluate those based on you know, a subset of the data that we know the answers for, and then we assess how accurate and how you know, comprehensive is its predictions. And then 
we ultimately take the most accurate model and we use it to predict the future uh, you know, behavior, in this case, member experience and member retention and things like that. So let's go ahead and give you a quick preview. I'm not going to get too technical here, but this is a little technical. So this is actually a, 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 a way that you can do both Python programming and AI development. It's called the Jupyter Lab. So within here, I can have blocks of texts and I can actually have executable code. So this is some code in Python is the language here. I can actually execute each block of code. In this case, I'm gonna start with importing some libraries that we need. I'm gonna kind of gloss over the how we extract the data because that's outside of this. But the gist is, as I mentioned, we pull it out of the database using reports or queries or APIs or whatever. And we get a raw output file kind of like this one here. And then we take that raw output file and we process it through a, an enrichment service. And we used one called Zoom Info that's pretty popular, also kind of expensive, but, but very useful. And then we get an enriched data file that has for each organization, you know, things like its revenue, you know, how long it's been in business or how long they've been a member and, you know, how many locations they have, are they public and private, what industry are they in, all that kind of thing. And then we feed all that into the model, right? We prepare the data, going to you know, run some different code here. I won't do all this. Again, it's a little bit technical. We train the model, um, and then we evaluate the model, and it tells us you know, information about how accurate or, or whatever. In this case, we get to be about 70% accurate or so. And then we ultimately use it to create an output file in Excel that has the, the information that we want. So real quick, let me... You pull up what the results look like so you can get a sense for what this, what the results really are of that whole process. Sorry, I'm waiting for Excel to come up right now. It's taking a second. Lots going on here. Waiting for Microsoft? Can't imagine that. What are the odds? Oh, it's hiding behind my other window over here. That's my problem. <laughs> All right, so. All right, so I'm bringing up output version two here. And the gist of it is, is it gives us back on, I, I erased all these calculations, but basically it gives us back a list of all the members. Um, and it would have, if I clicked on all those things, given us probabilities for each of those. And we can sort this by who's most likely to renew and who's least likely to renew, right? So, um, very quick view there, and I glanced over a couple things, but the gist of it is, you know, it, it, it enables you that kind of a model, that kind of a process, given the right input data, um, can answer some very interesting questions that are difficult, if not impossible, to answer any other way. Things like, you know, where are there opportunities to, um, you know, optimize resources and consolidate within an agency? Can we predict risks of internal misconduct based on historical data and trends. Um, which departments, programs, projects should we think about auditing based on their attributes or their, you know, purpose or whatever. And again, the past history of which ones, you know, typically um, we see some issues with or whatever. What are potential future needs for services and welfare and things based on demographic changes? So what's going on now? And then if we say, if this happens in the future, what would that do? And, and how would we be able to adapt and adopt to that, right? What are public sentiments? Things like, you know, examining all the Twitter tweets or whatever it's called these days, or, you know, all of the social media things that are happening. And it, we can say, are they positive? Are they negative? Are they neutral? Are they happy? Are they angry, right? And it can actually in, infer sentiment from those, those sorts of things which services or which programs or which laws or which candidates even, you know, have the highest satisfaction or dissatisfaction rates, again, based on behavioral trends, transitions and, and, and trends and things like that, right? So some very cool questions, very powerful things that this, cap this technology is capable of, right? If you feed it the right information. So let's talk about feeding the right information for a second, right? Now that we've explored a couple of different ways that this powerful technology can be used, there's some important considerations, right? Public AI versus private AI. So what we just saw, ChatGPT is an example of a public AI. So you can go out and you can go use their solution 
Um, it's a publicly available service that you can begin using immediately, right? Um, without any preparation, really. All you gotta do is sign up and off you go. Conversely, private AI, like the ones that I just gave you a very quick, quick glance at, um, are those that you build and train yourself or you know, with your own information. So this is piggybacking on that. I think this is yeah. where is, uh, there's somebody that has the question, is chat GPT something we can use in your own government computers, potentially, but it yeah. depends on your agency, right? But <clears throat> the other part of that is looking at the data that is housed now. You, now you're talking about data that can be housed within an organization kept within that organization and utilized within that organization, right? That's what you're, yes. that's where you're headed? Absolutely, yep, exactly, yeah. right? And so that specifically is this next bullet point here about data sources. Public AI solutions like JGPT are trained using typically vast amounts of data that is sourced by the owning company, in this case, OpenAI, and often pulled from the internet, right? The vast amounts of information available on the internet. Private, AI solutions, conversely, use private data, your data, and in this case, your government agency data, right? And not external data, not publicly available data. And that opens up a ton of new opportunities. You can leverage insights that you know nobody else has potentially. Um, you don't really need any special knowledge of AI to use ChatGPT and other public solutions, while obviously significant experience is needed to build and create your own private AI solutions. When you use public AI solutions, it is very important to understand that they can capture and retain all the input you provide, which they can use however they want to. So that means that they can use it to keep training, keep making adjustments, um, doing whatever they want to do with that data basically right whereas private ai solutions input data can be kept private right you can control that and, and limit what it can get used for the implications on privacy are that it, you should not put proprietary or confidential data or any other intellectual property into a prompt or anything else in a public engine right that is potential breach of confidentiality you know, IP laws, all other kinds of bad stuff, because it's not safe, it's not secure, it's not private. If you put it into a ChatGPT prompt, ChatGPT can remember that, it can take that, it can use that to train or to do whatever they want, right? So very important. Yes, go ahead and use ChatGPT, but do not put any confidential, private, proprietary, non-public information into it. Anything, you know, you don't put anything into it, you wouldn't put into a you know a search box basically right same so, sort of so don't put in is this social security number correct for me <laughs> exactly <laughs> don't no, do that no private health care information no private yeah. you know identifiable no phi pii none of that stuff right yeah. if you do want to use proprietary and sensitive data and intellectual property you will have to create a private AI solution where you can control it end to end and you know what's going in and what's coming out and how all of it gets used in the middle. So and, if you want to use proprietary data, it has to be a private AI solution that you invest in developing yourself. And that goes to that question, can I use it on government systems? Right. The controls, that's going to be, that's going to be defined by the controls and operations of your agency as to exactly what's going to be allowed into it, what's going to be allowed for access, what you're going to for all of the the background those what did you call them libraries is that what it is yep yep, yep. all that stuff all yep. that. yeah absolutely right and so you know getting a little further into this there are several different ways of looking at the myriad of considerations that are related to trust risk security and privacy in the world of ai right we're going to explore these in a couple of different ways over the next few slides here and hopefully that'll kind of clarify and highlight some of the most significant considerations one of the earliest and yet still very relevant attempts to define a framework to address AI issues related to trust, risk, and security, and, and beneficial AI as opposed to harmful AI is known as the Asilomar AI Principles. And it's a set of 23 guidelines for ethical research and development of AI in private and government and higher ed that were developed during the Asilomar Conference in 2017, right? Since then, these principles have been endorsed and upheld by something like six 
thousand now influential AI experts, researchers, and, and developers, right? Not everybody, right? I can't, I can't promise that all the big companies are following all these rules, but they should be, they try to, and they when they do not, um, then that's when things get a little bit questionable, right? The Deloitte Trustworthy AI Framework is another notable example of a model for implementing AI solutions successfully and safely. By ensuring that all the solutions and use cases meet key standards along six dimensions of trustworthiness, the Deloitte Framework helps you manage and mitigate the risks and while maximizing value, right? It helps ensure that you're adhering to best practices and staying aligned with, you know, the thing that all the requirements that the government and other organizations are now, you know, developing and publishing, right? According to this framework, for example, all AI systems should be fair and impartial and transparent and explainable, responsible and accountable, robust, reliable, respectful of privacy, and safe and secure, right? And note the icons here on the left. I, I chose those, you know, to kind of highlight some of these things. Um, and here's another example of a list, in this case, of seven instead of six char characteristics of trustworthy and responsible AI, in this case, from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. I'm not going to read this one to you, but virtually all the same words are appearing here that were on the previous slide, um, other than kind of splitting out one bullet related to transparency and explainability. The icons are the same on this, and they kind of relate. So you can connect the dots on all these things. And the gist is, you know, there's multiple ways to say this, but the same kind of core concepts here, right? And it's really about voluntarily adopting a do no harm approach and really trying to do the right thing and being aware of the fact that inherent biases and inherent, you know, attributes of the data used to train these engines can can and will show up in the output, right? So all these things, you know, some of this is easier said than done, but these are the goals you should strive for whenever you're both using or creating AI solutions, right? So that whirlwind tour kind of wraps things up. Um, a <laughs> couple of quick takeaways, then I'll shut up for a second. Matt, we can, uh, Dave, sorry, Matt's not here. Um, <laughs> we can open up some Q&A, right? So yep. real quick, we've covered a lot, a lot, obviously, right? I've been talking fast and, and trying to get through a lot of stuff here, but um, many, we've talked about lots of the ways that these things can be used in everyday work, right? With some additional investments, even more compelling value propositions open up in the world of private AI that we mentioned. We've also taken a little bit of a look here at some of the ways things can go wrong and, and what, you know, you should be watching out for and keeping in mind as you start to use these technologies. I would encourage, we kind of already said this, but, you know, I would say go try openai.com, go try ChatGPT or, or the Playground sign up for a free account and, and spend some time getting familiar with this. Be careful not to put anything secure or private or confidential into it, but, you know, go see what it does. There's a lot of cool capabilities here. And of course, the other thing I would suggest is that, you know, there are ways and, and give some thought to ways that bespoke custom private AI solutions can have a more, in, even more meaningful and impactful, um, you know, uh, impact on your agencies and organizations. And keep in mind, you know, those risks and responsibilities, because we don't want the world where we've got, you know, the Terminator robots and Arnold and Will and Tom coming to get us or coming to save us from the AI for that matter either, right? So yeah. love it. Awesome stuff. Yeah. All right. Let me uh let me go back. I'll I'll share my screen now. Yeah, if you want to pop pop yeah. that we're gonna make sure everybody can can get access to uh if you have any if you have anything for jeff there's jeff's email address right there i popped in the uh in the chat and i was answering for everybody because antonio was saying how good looking i was on my webcam thank you very much antonio he said what's your freaking webcam <laughs> so i told him and i wound up telling everybody so my apologies for that um any other real questions besides how how i can get myself to snazzy on, on webcam <laughs> Uh, you can you can uh, pop it in the chat or you can uh, raise your hand. We love to chat about those. Uh, and while we're doing that, I'm going to pop open this poll so we can get everybody out of here. Oh, time! We'll get you there. If you'd like to continue the conversation and you want to discuss something in your particular agency, I think there's one particular agency that's here that had like 18 people or something uh, that may want to have this conversation specific to a within what what you're trying to solve, right? So so 
yes, every chat GPT, um, when you start getting your, your fingers on that, right, Jeff, it, yep. it'll blow your mind at first. And then all of a sudden, it'll be, you get this little twinge of, uh, well, that's kind of weird. And then you'll start, you know, using, being able to massage it a little bit. Uh, I have, uh, can you go back to the slide on how agencies are using the AI, the first slide that Eric is asking for? So I will stop sharing my screen. Um, so the question. Just one second, we'll get that, Eric. You, you pull that one up. I want everybody to know that you're going to get the briefing presentation. You'll get a link to the video. And if you're asking for an agency slash one-on-one -on -one meeting, a team meeting within there to be able to discuss a particular challenge with AI, uh, Jeff will make himself available. And and uh, here's his information. We'll pop that back up in just a minute. I'm going to stop sharing so you can pull that back up for Erica, who is asking for that. Um, and for those of you who are asking to discuss AI in your agency, um, and Matt or Jeff or somebody from Divine will get in touch with you for that. I promise. Go ahead. Is this the slide that we wanted to see? Erica? Was it the list of... Let me see. Where's Erica? And I'll get a I'll get your good question, Pamela, in just a second. Let me let me find Erica. I'm trying to trying to navigate this. As you can tell, every once in a while, mm -hmm. I my navigation skills are suspect. Uh Erica, let me find you. And when I start sharing, there you go, I Erica. Allow you to talk. Go ahead, Erica. What do you is this the one you were looking for? No, there are two slides. One was like a more advanced use of AI. Yes. Is that this one, one the first? and this one, right? Yeah, that's the more advanced one. Yeah, the, the one before that. This one is the one. Going. Yes, yeah. yes. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, um, Abe, you can tell them how, but but we make this presentation available to you. So you can. Ba bam. Right there copy. in the chat box. Oh, there you go. Right there. The link. So you can get that for yourself, Erica. Anything you want to talk about specific, Erica? No, um, I'm still trying to figure out how I can incorporate like chat GPT into writing policy, et cetera. So um, just looking for ideas. Yeah, that's a great question. And so, you know, one of the things that I do a lot, you know, when I think probably the thing that I use it most for is kind of an aid and a jump starter for doing any kind of writing basically, right? So put in a kind of general prompt that says, write an introductory paragraph, about whatever it is you're trying to write about. And um, you know, it'll give you something back that's useful. And you can click it a couple of times and it, have it generate different versions of that. And then I usually take that. It's in my experience, it's almost never, you know, great out of the box. And I always want to tweak it and wordsmith it and maybe even rearrange it and you know rewrite it in some cases. But for me, it's a great way to get over writer's block or to get started or to get, you know, what are the most important aspects or considerations? And they'll give you, like I said, they'll give you a list of those things and you can take it or leave it and definitely double check them all because it might make stuff up on you. But it's usually <laughs> a good, you know, way to get, you know, I think jump started or, you know, get pump primed or whatever you want to call it in terms of some input material that you can kind of work into whatever it is that you're trying to write or create. That's one way I use it that it's very useful. Another way is research, right? So instead of surfing around and trying to identify a bunch of websites where people have written articles or said something about this, I ask questions of ChatGPT and say, what's the recent considerations or you know, what's you know important about this or whatever, and um, can jumpstart or short circuit the research needs in some cases too. So that's just a couple of quick examples, but there's a ton out there and it really is, you know prompt engineering or writing a good prompt is basically how you program these engines. And so it's worth kind of getting your head around what kinds of, you know, things can you ask it or how do you write your prompt or how do you give it examples of the style of output that you want as mm -hmm. part of that prompt. And it, it will tweak and tune what it gives you back to, to hopefully better meet what you're looking to do. Love it. And Pamela's asking, is someone cheating? Is someone cheating in an application if they use chat GPT? Great question. Uh, what are the ethics for applicants and implementing com uh, competitions? All great questions. And there, that is not something that Jeff or I can answer because that's way above our pay grade. Well, I, you know, I'll offer kind of my opinion and perspective on it, which is, you know, absolutely what Dave just said. That's a, first of all, it's a gray area and it's an area where 
the laws and the policies and the thought processes even are evolving and, and changing. And it's a big need, right? But <laughs> my thought is, and my kind of approach is, you know, is just don't, if you do use it, confess to using it, right? And, and maybe even explain a little bit about how you use it, because there's a difference between having it right, you know, in newscasters and news people and journalism and, and writing and all that stuff is a thing. Using it as a research tool or as a, as, you know, as an input thing is different than having it do your homework for you, mm -hmm. right? So if, as long as I think, as long as you're upfront that you used it and how you used it, um, then it's, probably okay. It's not certainly okay, but at least it's much better than if you're hiding it or lying about it or, you know, having it do your homework for you and then not confessing that you did that, right? And Antonia says, are you cheating if you use a dictionary when writing your yet resume? Exactly. So if you use it as a tool, it's fine. If you use exactly. it, write it for you and pretend that you wrote it, that's when it gets into very questionable, if not just flat out, not good, you know, ethics and legality and other things like that yep yep all right give me back this so they can contact you right. um <laughs> and i'll make my screen available again um and and antonio actually asked a great question when will open ai be accessible on the gov network because they're blocking it at va right so the answer is i don't we're not going to know that but you can ask yep. your systems administrator um I would also suggest you try, I mean, go explore AI.gov, that site that we mentioned at the yeah. start. You know, that's got a lot of great information. If it doesn't have answers there, maybe it has links to where you can get those answers or yeah. some right into how to track that down, because that's a great question. And it's also kind of changing at this point. So Yeah, and it, and it, it is rapidly evolving, as you said, Jeff. That I mean, think about it. When was the last time you had something that has been so incredibly encapsulating between November right was when the the initial one came out and these advanced models are they're coming out and uh new it, models new different pro approaches to it yeah i mean it's going to be every bit as disruptive as the internet was in the Ooh, 90s you, and as good word. social media has been for the last 20 years or whatever and this is the next thing that's that level of industrial revolution kind of thing that's a good word i'll tell you what awesome stuff man i always love it and as as we continue to build on this, because this has been a topic of conversation multiple times on GovBrief, and we appreciate you being here, and and I we appreciate everybody joining us and the interaction, um, and and the levity too, right? We got to keep it light, otherwise everybody's going to be flipping out about uh, about the Terminator and the rest of stuff. Um, Life serious enough as it is, right? Dave? That's right. We don't need anything. <laughs> True. Awesome stuff, Jeff. Thanks so much. Uh, reach out to Jeff, uh, and, and somebody will reach out to you if you ask for it. They'll 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 be getting back in touch with you to discuss this within your organization. If there's anything that's really urgent, make sure you reach out to Jeff directly so it doesn't get lost. And no. other than that, any of that parting comments for all the the folks that stuck it out to the last final minute here? I mean, go forth and use AI. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> Responsibly. Responsibly. That's right. Fantastic. Awesome, guys. Thank you very much. Thanks for all the kudos. We appreciate it. And we'll Thanks see you much. next time. And we'll keep Thanks you in the day. loop. Yep. Take care. All right. See you guys.